Welcome to Around the Shop with 360 Woodworking. Your hosts are Chuck Bender and Glenn Huey. Each Saturday tune in for the best in woodworking tips, techniques and general shop fun. Now, here's the 360 guys, Chuck and Glenn. So we're going to start out this week with a question from a reader. And remember, if you send us a question, we read it on the show. We send you a coffee mug. So uh, this one comes in from Mark. And Mark's question was, how tight should router bits be tightened in the collet? Should I do a death grip tight or something less? I've been doing something not quite approaching death grip tight ever since I had a spiral upcut bit slip several years ago and cut deeper than I wanted. Well, for me, that happened to me a lot when I started woodworking. And so I just developed this death grip on it for a long, long time. But the problem was... I was using a router from the 60s, 70s, well, and I was using, you know, it just, it was moving. So I've changed my approach at this point, and for the most part, I'm just snugging things up tight. Me too. But there's a few things you really need to, to make sure. You need to make sure that you don't have debris on your router bit um, the shank. shank. You need to make sure that you don't put the shank in so far that you get into the rounded area where the metals kind of joined and welded because what will happen then is that will vibrate a little bit out and then it will be loose and fall right. down. So You want to make sure that you're not totally bottoming out in the collet. Right. You know, so put Same it in idea. there until it bottoms out and bring it back up an eighth of an inch. Mm-hmm. Not, a, take. not an inch and a half. <laughs> well, I think we've all had uh, router bits come out on us or slip. Uh, it's not fun. But today, there's really no reason that you should put a death grip on. You no, just I, want to tighten it up. Exactly. I, I, you know, and I use two full-size open-end box wrenches mm-hmm. for when I tighten and loosen my mm-hmm. router collets. And literally, I bring them together until they snug up. As soon as they make contact, I go about an eighth of an eighth of a turn at the most, and that always locks it in. Yeah. Obviously, on a much larger diameter bit, you got to put more of a squeeze well, on sure. it yeah. because you've just got more mass there yeah. that's going to start to come loose. Yeah, I, I generally use the wrenches that come with uh, the tools, and um, it's one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of the thumb lock because right. uh, I'd rather use two wrenches. So when I do, as I bring them together, I'll bring them together, snug them, and then I'll put one hand over both wrenches and just give it a little a bit. Squeeze. Because I figure if I get behind it all the way, that's too tight, but this is tight enough. Right, and technically speaking, it is harder to loosen something than it is to tighten something, which mm-hmm. is sort of weird. Most mm-hmm. people don't understand that. Mm-hmm. So if you put the death grip on there, um, you're probably going to need a hammer to get it apart. <laughs> And uh, I'll, I'll read on because he had the same question could be asked about table saw blades, too. Yeah, exactly the same. Just yeah, put you know, it in and snug it up and move yeah. on. And, you know, the thing is with the table saw blade, um, first of all, it, it mean, if it's slipping, it's not cutting. And right. I, I don't think I've ever seen one slip that I had tightened down. And the other thing with that is as it's spinning at that force and you hit it with the wood, you're actually spinning, you know, that you're making that thing a little bit tighter. tighter. Yeah. So Right. So if you start yeah. out with a death grip yep. on there and mechanically as it comes in contact with the wood, mm-hmm. it tightens it even more. Mm-hmm. You know, that mechanical advantage, you're going to tighten it a whole lot more than you could by hand, which means you're going to need the hammer to take it apart too so <laughs> so um, all right so mark yep we got a mug coming your way buddy yep, coming at you mark all right so let's talk about today's topic on around the shop and uh, we're going to talk about aniline dyes excellent yeah and this is a topic one of we, my favorite topics yeah this is a topic we covered a little bit at the woodworking shows mm-hmm. and i thought it was interesting as we started through we use the same products we work with them a little differently and so let's right, kind of do talk it right about. and you do it yeah, your way. Yeah, yeah, here we go again. Gosh, I throw back to January, February, and March. <laughs> um, um, when we talk about aniline dyes, my personal preference is I like the powders. Yep. And the other, the liquid that comes, um, I'm not real big fan of. I use it occasionally, and but when I use it, I'm using it to tint shellacs and things like that. Right. And not so much to use to mix to dye my entire project. Right. And... I, because we did this at the, all the woodworking shows mm-hmm. this year, I also know why, but I'm going to ask you because they don't know. So why do you prefer the powders over the... So the powders I use are Moser's, and they're a brand of Lockwood. And Lockwood makes probably 
plus percent of the powdered dyes. Uh, the liquid dyes that I have available to me are the ones that come from the, the woodworking stores. And my preference is on the powder because I get a much more even coloration and an even coating. And I feel like the liquid, when you mix it up and use it, it's too transparent. And you either have to put on an extra coat, which as again is something we'll get into a little later because we both have different ways that we go about it, sure. or you have to uh, make it a higher concentrate. Right. And uh, I just find it easier to use the powders. They're consistent, they're easy, and they're right. work. Now, and I haven't really noticed that much of a difference between the powders and the, the liquids. Um, what I like the best about the liquid ones, uh, you can mix them up and use them pretty much right away. The the, I, the powders I like to let sit for a while really? so that they dissolve a little better. Yeah, see, I, but that's I something don't else. really go at it. Well, let's talk about the, the whole mixing thing. Um, on the Moser dies, and I, then this is what I use, so this is how I'm gonna refer to it. It says you can mix one ounce to four cups of water or two ounces to four cups of water. Well, you know, <laughs> Wait, you can use half the product or you can use all of the product. So I always mix one ounce to four cups of water. Right. Okay. And I'm very scientific. And if you don't weigh this out and get it just right, you no, know, I'm just joking. Are you kidding me? Uh, you get close with this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and the whole thing is, you know, you, you mix enough for the job and don't try to put a new formula together as, you, as you're in the right. middle of a project. So the little tips to, yeah, to, to run through. Yeah, mix up a little extra right. so that you're not sitting there running short at the, you know, and you've got a mm -hmm. third of the project left and you're running <laughs> out, so. Right, so at that point, the way I, I mix this is I heat my water, I put the water over a burner and I heat it. And what I wanna do is just get the bubbles coming up off the bottom, I don't want, you know, a roll, rolling boil. And it's just heating it enough and then I pour the powder into my jug, I pour the water into my jug, put the lid on, put the lid on and tighten it up. He means it, folks, because he's gone home yeah. antique mahogany several times. I have no doubt. Just this week. Yep, no doubt about it. And it's only Tuesday. <laughs> so put it together and shake it up. And uh, what happens is the hot water starts to expand and you have to release some of the pressure off the jug. And, and once it does that, it. yeah, retighten it <laughs> and, and set it aside for a little while. But after that, I pretty much can use it. And I know there's uh, the, some people talk about straining it. I don't strain it. I just pour it in my cup and use it. Right. Well, see, that's where the straining comes in because they're using it a little too quick. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think of it, you know, in terms of just any kind of a powder that you're trying to dissolve in a liquid, you know, you've got to give that time to basically become a saturated solution. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you mix it in there, you're still gonna have some larger particulates. So if you can let it sit for an hour or a day or yeah. a week, it's gonna be different than um, if you mix it up and then start going at it. So that's why they're, I think they're trying to strain it because the only time that I've ever really had problems is if I mix something up instantly mm -hmm. and started to use it now. And so what's the problem? As far as... Yeah, if you use it and it's <clears throat> and it's not mixed fully, what's gonna happen? Well, the only thing that I've seen is sometimes, especially if you're using some of the darker colors, like we, we would have a dark mahogany uh, powder that we would add just the tiniest little bit to some of our stains to kick it a little bit redder or whatever. And if you've got a clump of that stuff and you're brushing see now that's the other thing is I brush mm -hmm. on my dyes sure. so if you're brushing that on all of a sudden that little pill of dark mahogany uh, dye powder mm -hmm. breaks and you now have this bright purple streak across the yeah, face well, of your I can see that so uh, yeah. that's why and and what I found was I mean I mix it totally different than you mm -hmm. do. I yeah, don't, I, I don't I heat up should, the water yeah we should go through how you mix it let's just step back and, and do that because you do mix it different I, I start out by putting all my powders into my container mm -hmm. and I know you use an opaque yep gallon jug yeah um, a lot of the times I just use a quart jar because so are you making it specifically for that job and then you're done with it I mean the reason much. I put it in opaque is it protects it from sunlight and sunlight as we know dyes the or uh, fades these dyes right so by putting in an opaque jug i can keep it and mix in it to the next time and use it for the next project and things like right. that so i'm not making it per project um yeah i tend to make it per project but even at that you know I, 
I've always kept things in um, a fire cabinet, oh. so it, it's dark. It's still protected from light. Right. right. So right. it's only out in the open as long as we're using it, right. and then it goes back in there. So I'll put all the powders into the container, and then what I do is we usually keep a squirt bottle of denatured alcohol around, and it's just a, an, it's literally an old uh, dishwashing detergent oh, yeah. Yeah. bottle that we cleaned out and fill it up with uh, denatured alcohol, and I squirt just enough in there to get the powder dissolved. It tends to not pill up like it does if you drop it in water. Mm -hmm. but it just seems to work better. No, that's that fine. Way. So, you, so you you're get a, turning the powder into a, a liquid solution and then right. adding. And and I might only be adding an ounce or two mm -hmm. of the denatured alcohol. And then I take that and to that I just add room temperature water. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I bring it up to the full quart just like you do. You yeah. have four cups. Yeah. Okay. And at that point, put the lid on it, shake it, put the lid on it, and <laughs> shake it. Yeah. I, I think we you know we, we kind of pound that point but man if you ever not do that it's a such a mess to clean up yeah you know it uh especially if you're working like in your living room or something you know now you've got to refinish out the walls the floors sometimes the ceiling i don't know how um, many people are going to be putting dye on in their living room you never know um so anyway yeah no i i mix it up that way and then uh i usually let it sit and i I like to let it sit from anywhere. Like I'll mix it up in the first thing in the morning and then use it after lunch or I'll mix it up at the end of the day so that I have it for tomorrow. Uh -huh. that um, and that way, you know, when I come in, when I go to use it, I shake it up one more time and that way any of those little pills have broken down and if there's, you know, any particulate floating in there, it's actually dissolved into the, hmm. in the solution. And that's, that's a great thing about aniline dyes is yeah. unlike using a pigmented stain where you have the particulates of the the pigments right. floating in the solution it's more right. it's more of an emulsion mm -hmm. than what you get with a dye a, a dye is a true solution right. i mean it's so that's the reason i went to the aniline dyes because they are clean when you mix them up put them on your surface they highlight the wood they show the grain through they don't cover things up the stains that you buy with those particulates in it, they they it lays on top. You don't get the same color. Right. Well, it, and it, it does muddy things up a little mm -hmm. bit. I mm -hmm. mean, there's there's no doubt about that. But uh, going back to the liquid versus the powder, we were talking about. You you said something in there about adding a second. Either you have to make it more concentrated, or you have to add a second layer, mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. I end up always doing everything in multiple layers anyway to yeah. get my coloring. So, but you're what, using different colors. You're not doing multiple layers of the same color. Sometimes, really? but not. It's not planned that way. No Let's kidding. put it that way. Yeah. Um, well, I think this is a, this comes from a difference in how we apply it. So. Let's, right, you're, let's go you're, there. Right, no, go ahead. You go. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm putting it on with a brush, mm -hmm. and I'm. I always try and work with a drier brush. I I don't mind having dye on there that floods and fills the surface but what i don't want it to do is run down the face of something and puddle up somewhere because mm -hmm. that's the one spot that i'm going to forget mm -hmm. and then it's going to be you know forever dark mm -hmm. uh although the aniline dyes are much more forgiving than an oil stain or something yeah. like that i mean if you leave it puddled on an oil stain you've got a black mark forever yeah and and that's where we're different because i spray on my dyes and i totally saturate the piece i want it running off Right. And the reason I do is because it gives it time to soak into the wood. And I know that it soaks into the wood and it performs or presents a more even color all the way through. Sure. So I'm that's why I can mix up the lighter with the one ounce, because I'm only doing it once, but I'm putting it a lot on. And when I say puddle, I want it dripping off into a puddle on the floor. And the thing is, where it gathers, like on the edges of so moldings. like the way you glue things up. You put it on until it runs <laughs> no. off the bench. And no, not on the... <laughs> I don't do that. I'm not a glue uh, glue hound. Um, but with the dye, what happens is it puddles, but it's the same color as everything else because everything's been saturated. And when it's all done and I've finished, I go back and I wipe everything down completely with a couple dry rags and make right. sure it's cleaned up. And that's really the great thing about the aniline dyes. You, you said you get a more even color. And mm -hmm. the aniline dye, I mean, they use aniline dyes sure, to sure. dye that's where clothing it, that's and stuff. Originally where it started. And the idea is 
it tries to make everything one color. It's not like the pigmented stains where if you have a darker board mm -hmm. and a lighter board, you're going to continue to have a darker board and a lighter right. board. They, right. You know, it, it, it's the aniline dyes tend to penetrate a lot more and color the fibers deep down in rather mm -hmm. than the pigmented stains, which a lot of those lay on top. You still get yeah. some penetration because you're using an oil as a base. Right. Well, I'll it's go back to what I've noticed with using the aniline dye is I can take, you know, sapwood and heartwood and make them look pretty close. But three, four or five years later, those differences in the wood start to show up again. Sure. And see, that's where I turn around and I do things in layers. So I've always mixed a lot of them together into one thing to create a single color. Mm -hmm. But then I will use various concentrations of a homemade oil stain to enhance all of that. So I might put on something very, very thin that, you know, a very thin oil stain to help even things. And that's where, like, if I have a little bit of sap, mm -hmm. okay, I can dye the entire piece and get it fairly close, but then I can go back over that, uh, that sappy area with a little bit of oil stain or an additional modified uh, aniline dye hmm. and, and bring those colors in so that four or five years down the road, they still are a lot closer than if you just did one color. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. And that's just something that, um, that I've discovered actually from working with antiques and re doing antique restoration and repair work, mm -hmm. you know, you, because not everything old was made out of absolutely pure heartwood. Oh, no. Shoot, you know, that you'll find everything. sapwood oh, yeah. in a lot of that stuff. Sure, much more and, than we do today. And you have to try and blend that out because no one understands, wait a minute, that's a one board cherry case side and it's got sap? Mm -hmm. You know, this is, it's not an antique then, is it? <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, yes, it it's old. Yep. But, you know, you're <clears throat> supposed to have that nice homogenous, you know, color going mm -hmm. on over the whole thing. Yeah. So. So you said you mix and blend. Let's talk about that process. Um, I mix different colors of aniline dye to do things. Like, for instance, when I started out, I used golden amber maple on all my tiger maple. Six years into it, it's like that gold became so hard for me to take, and I wanted to, to knock some of the gold color out of it. Then I started mixing 50-50 golden amber maple and brown walnut. And so mixing the two, I mix them. I turn them both into liquids, exactly the same formulas, and then I'll mix from there in the liquids. Okay. So do you do it any different? Yeah, actually, I uh, we would experiment, and we got really good at it because we were trying to, instead of just making the piece this color or that color, mm -hmm. um, we spent a lot of time trying, and my wife is the one who did this for the last five or ten years of the that we were building furniture full time for people. Mm -hmm. um, and she's got a really good eye for it. We would, somebody would say, I want this to go into my bedroom and I want it to sort of blend with everything else that's in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, send us, bring us, mail us, ship us, whatever, a small drawer, something, and we'll try and get pretty close to it so that at least it flows around. Mm -hmm. So we would actually mix up, we knew where the powders were gonna take us at that point and we would have probably three dozen different colors in the shop mm -hmm. at any yeah. given time. Yeah. Wow. Start mixing those up, um, get it close, and then start adding powders to tweak it one way or another until we got close to where we were gonna mm -hmm. be. And we have an entire, I mean, we have a huge binder full of formulas mm -hmm. so that even if we still have the same powders, because yeah. the powders change constantly yeah. and with all the government regulation, things have changed even more. So what you buy as honey amber maple today mm -hmm. isn't going to necessarily be honey amber maple yeah. in 10 years. Yeah, or what it was, you know, ten, uh, five years back. Right, sure. and you're, because there's more fillers in there, mm -hmm. the, the certain things become illegal to use, yeah. you know. Well, I think it's interesting that you, you do your mix and colors to get close with the dyes. I kind of did, if I was matching something, not necessarily, I didn't do a lot of it, but if I was matching pieces, I would do, I would get really close with the dye, and then I would make the final adjustments with my top coats. So you would be tinting the shellac. Tinting the shellac, so, using the different colors of shellac, playing that, that game as well. Right. Yeah. That's, not, that's not a bad idea either. I mean, 
we did a lot of that too. Mm -hmm. But um, our primary method to get close was to try and get that background color with the aniline dye. And then sometimes we would need to add a slightly different color shellac or um, some kind of a oil stain glaze or something like yeah. that to start pushing it and pulling it in. Right. Um, we did a lot of experimentation and stuff and it's you know it's it can get crazy i mean we had oh, one, yeah. one customer that we started making color samples for and we would send him a sample pretty much every day we sent him we labeled them using we labeled them alphabetically mm -hmm. and we went from a through z and then went back to double k before we got Jeez. to the color that it was okay i think i'd have found a new customer long <laughs> before that Man, yeah, but it's what we do, you know. We, yeah, no, that's so. what you have to do. Sure. Yeah. So I know there's a whole lot more we can talk about with Anil and Dye, and I'm sure there'll be more down the road. Oh, sure, and I guarantee you we'll talk more about <laughs> Absolutely. it. Absolutely. But right now, we're bumping up against the clock. So anything you want to add? No, I think that'll do it. We'll see you next week. Join the 360 guys next week and every Saturday for more woodworking talk from around the shop. 